In this message, we will discover what it means to truly worship God. How should we worship? What happens when we worship? And about worshiping God in difficult circumstances. Okay, before we start, uh, why don't we all stand and do uh, make our declaration? Uh, stand up, hold your Bible in the air, and um, let's declare it. Just want to say that you know, the Word of God, Joshua 1 and verse 8, God gives, instruct Joshua, and he says, This book of law shall not depart from your mouth. He says, This book of law shall not depart from your mouth. Mouth, which means that God wants this to be part of our speaking, our confessing. Amen? And that is why we do this, to just to get the hang of declaring the word, declaring the truth over our lives. So let's do this. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I believe His word. I receive his word and I live by his word. Christ is my master and to him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just turn to your neighbor, shake hands with them and say, confess the word. Yes. Confess the word. Declare the word. You know, when things are going fine, it's the easiest thing to do, right? But it's when things are tough, when things are difficult, then confessing the word becomes a problem because the reality, what you're experiencing, is, seems to be totally contrary to what we are confessing and declaring. But those are the moments that we need to declare the word, speak the truth, confess the truth. So let's continue to do that. Okay. Uh, so these, uh, this month, these four Sundays, we're going to be looking at uh, worship, the whole aspect of worship, and uh, we're going to look at some foundations of worship, and we're going to look at um, how can I worship alone when there's no worship team, I'm used to having the band, I'm used to having the music, how can I worship alone? And when I come together as a church, as a congregation, you know, how can we worship then we're going to look at uh, spontaneous worship. You know, do I worship with what is there on the screen? Do I worship God with the words that is there on the screen? Or can I just worship out of the fullness of my heart? Spontaneous worship, prophetic worship. How can we as a church engage in it? So we're going to be studying that. And lastly, we're going to look at how worship is not just an event on Sundays or not even a moment of time uh, during the week, but it's our entire life. Okay, so that's what we're going to be uh, learning this uh, month. And today we're going to look at um, this topic of understanding worship. You know, which is the best place to go to if you want to understand some word? Sorry? The scriptures, okay, I looked at the dictionary <laughs> and I just wanted to see what worship means. Right? And the dictionary says that worship is the expression or the act of love, adoration, respect, and honor. Okay, simply put, this is what worship is. But you know, the thing is, this aspect of worship, when you look at worship, it goes beyond all definition. It goes beyond definition. A definition is a very poor thing to actually explain the meaning of worship. And it defies all definitions. And you realize that when you read the word of God and you try to learn about worship. It defies all definitions. So that's what the dictionary says, but uh, we know that worship is beyond that. So it comes from the, it derives its meaning from the word worship, an old uh, English word which means 
to esteem something very highly, right? To esteem something highly. Okay. So did you know that everyone worships? Everyone. Whether you're a believer, whether you're an unbeliever, whether you're rich, poor, educated, uneducated, whether you believe in God, or if you don't believe in God, you still worship. Everybody worships. The object of worship could be different. Right? But everybody worships something or someone. You know, if you move God out of the picture, something else fills that void. It could be a person. It could be, it could be power. It could be position. It could be money. It could be an ideology. An atheist still worships. Right? Because all of us are created as human beings to, to be in awe of something, to give ourselves wholeheartedly to something. We are created like that. But that object of worship, if it's not God, then something else takes that place. But one thing is for sure, everybody worships. Can we say that together? Everybody worships. But who we worship, what we worship, that is different. In church, everybody worships. When we say the word worship, you know, many images come to our minds, right? Singing, choir, band, many things. So we need to look into the word and really study the word and say, what does the Bible talk about worship? It could be very different from what we have. And all of us, even as believers, as Christians, all of us come from different backgrounds. We are used to different forms of worship. Some like it really loud. But some prefer things to be a little soft. Right? Our expression of worship differs. Our idea of worship differs. So it's good to look into the word and, and study and see, you know, what does the word talk about worship? So the first question is, what is worship? When you look into the word and study, what is worship? You know, now, we're not trying to attempt this question in, you know, in, in today's message, but we're going to come back to this question time and again. It's going, to be, it's going to be line upon line and layer upon layer every Sunday. When we come back to this question, what is worship? Things are going to be added you know, line upon line. But when we look at this question, what is worship? Uh, when we turn to Psalm 95 and verses 6 and 7, the psalmist says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Right? Verse 6, he says, Come, let us worship and bow down. And he makes a very interesting statement. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. He says, let us kneel before him. Let us worship him. He's our maker. The second thing he says in verse 7 is, he is our God. So the first thing we see is that worship is actually a recognition of who God is. It's a recognition of who God is. Who he says he is. Which means that I identify and I accept who God is. I admit, I recognize this is who God is. And the best place to you know, to find out, to identify who God is, is in the written scriptures. And in the pages of his word, we see God coming and introducing himself in situations, introducing himself as Jehovah Jireh. And there's a story behind that. He comes and he says, I'm Jehovah Nissi. And there is a story there, there is a context there. And he says, this is who I am. So when we encounter God and his attributes... We recognize that. So immediately, we acknowledge and we say, oh, I accept this to be true. Because this is who he is. This is what he is saying he is. So worship is actually recognition of who God is. Acknowledging who God is. Recognizing his majesty. Acknowledging his power. Acknowledging his holiness. You know, Psalm 99 and uh, I think it's verse 5, it says, Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. He is holy. 
verse 9 says the same thing. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. So it's describing God as a holy God. So worship is to acknowledge that, recognize that, and acknowledge that, and saying, going in your own heart, in our own heart saying, God, you are holy. It's a first step. It's a simple step. Worship is recognition of who God is. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. But he who comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder. So when I come to God in worship, I must acknowledge that he is. That he exists. That he is all that he said he is. And also acknowledge that he is a rewarder. God is the one who rewards. That is one of his attributes. That is one of his character traits. So I come to him and I recognize who he is. Worship is recognition. Worship is also reverence for God. Okay, the first word is what? Recognition. Secondly, it's reverence. Reverence meaning utmost respect. To regard or treat with adoration and utmost fearful respect. Reverential fear and awe. So in worship, we come and respect him. We come and honor him. You know, God is who he said. He's a God of love. He's a God who, uh, you know, he says, no more do I call you my servants, but I call you friends. He's our friend. But he's also the one whose eyes are like flaming fire and whose feet are like refined bronze. The revelation talks about the glorified Christ, the soon and coming king, full of majesty and power. He's awesome God. The word of God also declares that he's a consuming fire. So worship is admitting, accepting and having utmost respect for him. To honor him. To say, God, you are who you said you are. Psalm 96 and verse 9, the psalmist says, Oh, worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Psalm 5 and verse 7, he says, As for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy in fear of you, I will worship towards your holy name. So when we come into church, you know, Psalm is saying, when I, when, I, when I step into church, I come with that fear of God. I come with that reverence. Worship is reverence for God. Worship is also communion with God. So recognition, reverence, and thirdly, communion. Now, communion is, is uh, you know, it's sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and innermost feelings. Sharing or exchanging intimate thoughts and innermost feelings. In other words, worship of God goes beyond the surface. It is not superficial. It is not saying something, singing something but it goes below the surface. It is sharing of innermost feelings. It is sharing of innermost thoughts. It's an exchange. In other words, intimacy, in other words, intimacy cannot happen without relationship. So I have that relationship with him. I walk with him. And I come to that place of intimacy and I share my innermost thoughts. It could be fear, it could be, it could be pain. I share it with him. I share my adoration of him. And communion, it's not just one way, but it's exchange of these things. So God shares as well. So it's communion of innermost feelings, innermost thoughts. And fourthly, Worship is a heartfelt response to an encounter. You know, we encounter God in the pages of Scripture. We encounter God with worship, in worship. We encounter Him. He manifests Himself. 
he introduces himself he says hello this is who i am and worship is our response to that encounter our response to that encounter you know look at one encounter that john has in the island of patmos you know revelation chapter 1 and verse 12 he says then i turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned i saw then he describes what all he saw and in verse 17 he says and when i saw him i fell at his feet as dead that was his response he saw him and he fell at his feet as dead his response to that encounter his response to encounter with almighty god sometimes that happens we encounter the benefits glory of god the presence of god and our physical body just seems to lose strength and we just have to fall at his feet and he says that again revelation 4 uh in verses 9 here it says the sorry verse 11 Uh, verses 9 to 11 we uh, read about the throne room worship and and verse 10 says the 24 elder, elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him they fall down they encounter his presence his beauty his power and the response is that they just fall down and worship so we see that it's recognition it's reverence for god it's communion with god it's a response to that encounter and we're going to be answering that question again and again what is worship so worship is definitely more than the songs we sing amen though we worship him in song but it's definitely more than the songs we sing worship is definitely more than the music we play scripture does encourage us to play skillfully psalm 33 and verse 3 play skillfully on your instruments so we need to do that but it's more than just the music it's more than just the song you know sometimes worship becomes a genre of music you know worship music nowadays there are awards for worship the you know, best worship artists etc etc right so it's more than just a genre of music with hallelujahs and praise the lord peppered all over the lyrics it's more than just that it's recognition of who god is it's reverence for god it's deep communion with god and it's our response to an encounter with him the lord jesus has had something to say about worship and we read read about it when he has this conversation with the samaritan woman the woman at the well uh the conversation starts with um, uh, talk, uh, thoughts about water and then he talks about living water and then she she says you know you jews you know you you say this is where we need to worship this is the place so they're talking about place and form of worship and then the lord has something very interesting very important to share about this aspect of worship and that we see in john chapter 4 and verse 23 he says but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such to worship him verse 24 god is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth she says the hour is coming you know she's saying you know should we worship him here should we worship him there on this mountain this mountain the lord says no 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 the hour is coming there is coming a time when the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth and the father is seeking you know he's searching he's looking he's desiring to find true worshipers so you know when we go through life or when we're on our own and when we come to church the father is actually seeking and he's desiring to find that true worshiper you know there there's a true worshiper there's a true worshiper who's worshiping in spirit and truth he's seeking he's desiring to find the true worshipers and very interesting thing the lord jesus says is that the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth so what does it mean in spirit it means that our spirit our innermost being our core of our being with our whole heart we are supposed to worship 
the true worshiper worships in spirit it's not a whole hearted thing and the lord had something to say about i'm sorry it's not a half hearted worship it's something which is whole hearted and in matthew chapter 15 verses 8 and 9 the lord says these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me and in vain they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men so when we don't worship out of our heart you know it could have it could be what we can call religious worship it could be devout it could have the right words it could have the pious actions but our spirit our heart is not engaging with the spirit of god the true worshiper worships in spirit it's a whole hearted thing it's all or nothing so as we worship let us seek to be true worshipers who will worship in spirit and the second thing he says is who will worship in truth so there's no pretense there's no hypocrisy there's no pretending there's no putting on an act but it's in truth truth is also according to the word because on john chapter 17 and verse 17 the lord says sanctify them by your word your word is truth so when we say i worship in truth it means that we worship as defined as described as prescribed in the word so it's not like saying hey i'm going to worship god like this this is me worshiping or oh, this is how i i'm going to worship you do your thing i do mine you know there are various forms of expression of worship but it has to be in truth and he says his word is truth so we study the word we see what god what do you have to say in the word and we worship him as prescribed in the word so he's looking for spirit and truth worship he's seeking true worshipers so we need to ask ourselves this question you know am i a true worshiper am i worshiping in spirit and in truth you know all through the years the expression of worship has changed right uh, uh it could be it could, you know there are times when the church had liturgical worship prayers written down for, and spoken or sung even today it's it's been done and uh, there are places where you have a you know full choir with an orchestral backing singing songs of worship to god or a more contemporary band you know singing choruses or singing hymns or maybe it's just one instrument you know you have the church organ and people singing or maybe a guitar or maybe no instruments you know i was in chatisgarh champa and the only instrument that they had was something called a dabli like it's percussion it's it's like a tambourine it's a hybrid tambourine it's tambourine and uh, you know it's got a skin so you beat it and that is the only instrument but the worship was whole hearted there were about 50 people 60 people their expression of worship was different the form of worship was different but it was spirit and truth so our the form of worship might change we could have you know creative arts and painting and dance and we could worship him in creative ways spoken word worship but something that cannot change is spirit and truth worship because the lord makes it very clear he says god is spirit and those who worship him you know if at all you're interested in worshiping he says you must worship he closes all the options he said this is the only thing those who want to worship must worship in spirit and truth so that's a check for us when we want to express worship in creative ways when we want to do it in different ways is it spirit and truth if it's yes then we go ahead so that's something that we see spirit and truth worship and the father is seeking worshipers you know we have two words in scripture which paint a uh, you know a, a picture of worship uh, one is in hebrew it's a word called shaka okay um, you want to say that okay shaka 
Okay, it means to prostrate, to bow down, to fall down, to revere, to beseech. To fall down, to prostrate, to revere, to beseech. So we see this word in Hebrew, the Old Testament. Then we see another word in Greek, which is proskunio, which means to kiss the hand, to prostrate, to adore, to revere. To revere. And it's like the dog licking the hand of its master. With all gratitude. You know, when you look at, if you have dogs as pets, you look into their eyes, what do you see? So much of adoration, right? They, they say, you know, the definition of dog and cat, God, you know, you feed the cat, you, I, I you know, apologize to all uh, cat lovers, but you feed and you do everything and, you know, you have the dog and the cat. The da dog looks and says, oh, you must be God. You know, you provide, you feed, you clean me, you protect me. But the cat has a different take on the whole matter. The cat looks and says, oh, you do all this to me, I must be God. <laughs> you know, but the picture is that of a dog licking the hand of its master. It's proskuneo. Right? So we have these two pictures uh, in, the, in the word. So, so what really happens when we, when we worship God? You know, do we add anything to God? Does he become bigger than he is? We know that we cannot add anything to him. You know, just because we say, you know, our God is an awesome God. How great is our God? It doesn't add anything to him. He's creator God, self-consistent. There's nothing we can take away or add to him. But when we worship him, the beautiful thing is this. Something happens to the worshiper. Amen. Something always happens to the worshiper in spirit and truth worship. Worship transforms us. It changes us from the inside out. If we are worshipping something that is not God, we are becoming like that. And the book of Isaiah talks about that. It says if there is something else that is not of God, then progressively you are changing to become like that. Your attitude, your thoughts, your behavior, everything, everything changes. But when we look at scripture, we see Ex Exodus 34, and it's uh, verse 27 to 30. Moses having an encounter with God. Moses is spending time with God and about 40 days and 40 nights he's with God and God is giving him those instructions and, and, and on these tablets, you know, he's, he's got it. And it says that his face shone. His time in the presence of God actually changed his physical countenance. There was a visible change in him. So people saw that, the Israelites saw that, they saw that his face was shining and then they said, they were afraid. They're saying, don't come near. There's something that has changed about you. So in the presence of God, when we worship him, when we encounter his glory, that is transformation. But the amazing thing is this, you know, in, in Moses' case, he didn't even realize it. It says, scripture says, Moses didn't know. He didn't know what was happening. He didn't know that he had changed. He comes before people and people are surprised. Hey, there's something that has changed in him. So there is change. There is transformation. There's marked change in our thoughts, in our actions, in our behavior, in our speech. Everything changes. I'm sure we can take a before-after picture, you know, when we worship in spirit and truth. It's not like the before after picture of, you know, these health products. The before is taken close up and the after is a, you know, long shot in a different angle. It's not like that, some dodgy health product, but it's marked change. It's change in our thoughts. In fact, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18, this is what um, Paul writes and he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit... And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory 
just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. When we encounter, when we behold as in the mirror the glory of God, we are being transformed from glory to glory. And the transformation is not like, uh, like a prophet or an apostle or a, or a man of God or a woman of God. But he says, we are being transformed into what? Into that same image. Oh, it's a great deal. Some deep-rooted things, some deep-seated things, something that we are struggling to change in the presence of God. As we spend time in the glory of God, we are being transformed into that image. So God is saying, that's the standard. I am your standard. And we become more and more like him as we worship him. So worship transforms us, changes us into that very same image. In worship, we experience God's presence. You know, God is present everywhere. But in worship, we become aware or sensitive to the presence of God and we experience the presence of God. You know, God promises degrees of his presence, right? God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. But he also says that where two or three are gathered, I'm there in your midst. And you also, you know, we, we see in the temple that Solomon built that as they worshipped, there was this tangible manifest presence of God, the glory of God, which was so tangible that they could not continue in worship. So he promises degrees of his presence. He chooses to reveal himself more and more. And in worship, we experience the presence of God. James chapter 4 says, draw near to him and he will draw near to us. That's a promise. So when we make that choice, God, I'm going to draw near to in worship, he draws near to us. And we know, you know, we experience the presence of someone standing here, even with your eyes closed, you know there is someone here. His presence is tangible. In the presence of God, great things happen, amazing things happen. There is conviction of sin in the presence of God. You know, something that you did and you didn't care, you know, it's okay. Everybody does it. But in worship, in the presence of God, there is conviction. And we become aware of the presence of God. And things that we did, and we said, okay, it doesn't matter. The things that we said to people, maybe in the presence of God, there is conviction. God says, hey, that's not right. In the presence of God, there is joy. There is joy in his presence. He releases his joy. And we're having a tough time, we're having a tough day, but in the presence of God, there is joy. In the presence of God, there is hope. Because he's the God of all hope. And he draws near, and it's as if he releases his hope within us. So the presence of God, we experience the presence of God. Um, we experience supernatural power. Miracles happen because he's a supernatural God. In the presence, in worship. And worship also, in worship, the Lord empowers us to rule and reign. You know, we have as believers, as new creations, our identity is that of kings and priests. We read that in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. It says, he loved us, washed us, and has made us kings and priests. And we read again in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, he says that you are a royal priesthood. Now, kings rule, kings reign. And what do priests do? Priests engage in worship. They offer sacrifice to God. So these two things, these two entities, if you want to call it that, are interlinked. We are a royal priesthood. So in worship, he empowers us to rise above circumstances. He empowers us to reign. He empowers us, even as we submit in worship, to have authority. We read that in James chapter 5, it says, Submit to God and resist the devil. As we submit to God in worship, we will resist the devil. He gives us authority. In submission, in worship, 
there is authority. Amen? So all these things happen in worship. And the question we might ask is, you know, sometimes I don't feel like worshiping. There are days when I, wor- when I feel like this is the day the Lord has made. And there are times when, you know, it's like, I hope the sun sets. From the rising of the sun <laughs> to the going down. I wish I could see the going down, right? So sometimes we have that impression that worship is a happy, clappy time. And only when things are, you know, are happy and nice, I can worship. But again, when we look into the word, we see that that's not the case. That's not the case. Yes, worship is celebration. But worship is also, you know, all those things, recognition of who God is and reverence for God in those difficult times. The psalm is in Psalm 34 and verse 1. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Does that challenge you? Oh, yes. He says, I will praise, I will bless the Lord at all times. And all times is, you know, when you have a mountaintop experience, when things are fine and when things are not so fine. And Habakkuk writes about that. Though the fig tree may not bud and the vine has no grapes, though the cattle stall is empty, yet I will joy in the Lord. I will rejoice in Him. So scripture is full of examples and one such person is Abraham. Genesis 22 with the son of promise the Lord comes and says one fine day you offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Right? So and the way he says it is very interesting. He tells Abraham Abraham, your only son, the son whom you love, you offer him. And Abraham like waited 25 years. And we don't know what was going on in Abraham's mind. God, what is this U-turn about now? After 25 years, what are you saying, God? There are many other ways to worship. I don't know what was going on. I'm just letting my imagination run loose, but he could have had many things going on in his mind with questions, with anxieties. Oh, what's going to happen? But we read in I'm sorry, uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Abraham says to the young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go, here, go there, go yonder and worship. He says, I will go there and I will worship. And he, and he makes a prophetic declaration. He says, and we will come back. We will come back. So we don't know what was going on in his mind. But he says, we will go there and we will worship. So he worshipped. He experienced the hand of God. He encountered God. He recognized who God was. And then God introduces himself as Jehovah Jireh. It is in that context he says, I am Yahweh Ire." I'm the God who provides. He provides that that ram. And he says, I'm Yahweh Yireh. So he has that encounter with God in worship. And we also read about David in 2 Samuel. His son dies. The child dies. And uh, 2 Samuel 12 and verse 19, he asks his servants, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. Verse 20, so David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Paul and Silas, Acts chapter 16, they are, in the, in, they are at Philippi, they are persecuted, they are beaten, they are beaten and most likely the backs would have been bleeding because of that flogging. Their feet are in stock, they are in prison and you know, total injustice. Sometimes, I know, it happens people's lives. Maybe it's happened to you. Maybe it's happened to some of us sitting here. There's so much injustice, so much pain, so much difficulty, so much discomfort. And they were in that place. Will we ever see the light of day? Will we live again? They're in that place. And we see something amazing happening here. 
verse 25 but at midnight paul and silas were praying and singing hymns to god and the prisoners were listening to them verse 25 in that pain in that physical discomfort in that uncertainty maybe fear they were praying and they were singing hymns to god you know um i was actually once doing my internship in chennai and chennai you know how the weather is we are blessed some people have all the blessing we are blessed but the weather is terrible in chennai and i was there in summer and it was my summer project and <clears throat> doing this internship so uh, you know if you've never gone by electric train in chennai you should in summer you know everybody's sweating and uh, there's noise, there's uh, the whole lot of things happening. There's life happening in the electric train, right? People are cutting vegetables, they're, you know, everything is happening, maybe changing diapers there, whatever. But, you know, and I was complaining. I was complaining. I said, God, you know, what am I doing here? And on top of that, I had to wear formal clothes, wear a tie. And I was visiting banks and, uh, you know, software companies and, and talking to people and, and you know, going about and I was wondering you know I didn't have a vehicle then so electric train bus walk and I'm like saying God what is this when will this end you know I, I just I'm sick of this place I'm sick of this people and I just want to go back home and at that moment you know in the train mm, uh, I heard this singing it was this Tamil song that we've heard you know we've sung many times and uh, it was a song which goes like this, Magilvom, Magilvom, Dina Maga Magilvom, which means rejoice, rejoice, let us rejoice. And uh, I forget the next line, but then he says, um, uh, the songwriter goes on to say uh, in the chorus, Anandame, um, means, you know, joy, great joy, Paramanandame, great joy. Idu maaperum bakyame, oh, what a privilege. In the Pardalatin Sundakar Aravar, meaning the one who owns the earth okay the ones who owns all this in then ullathil sundamanar you know he's come and he's taken residence in my heart loud singing and i turned to see and there was this lady who could not see she was blind she was begging and she was singing with all her heart she was, oh anandame paramanandame now, I don't know whether she meant the words of the song, but I just broke down there. I said, God, who am I to complain? I'm sitting there comfortably. I'm going, doing my thing. There's this lady who's singing this, Magilvom, Magilvom. She can't even see. And that, that just changed me. I said, God, I'm sorry. You know, another person who challenges us is Fanny Crosby. She became, she couldn't see at the age of, I think, six weeks or something. They put some uh, stuff in her eyes and she lost her eyesight. And, but Fanny Crosby, you know, somebody asked her, Fanny, doesn't it trouble you? She lived in the 19th century, right? Uh, doesn't it trouble you that you cannot see? Now, Fanny had this response. She said, uh, well, I, I tend to look at it this way. When my eyes are open, when I see, the first face that I see will be the face of Jesus. Now, we can say, oh, she didn't believe in healing, <laughs> you know, miraculous healing. We don't know, but, but this is what she said. What a perspective. And believe it or not, she wrote 8,000 songs of worship. Not one, not two, not thousand, not two thousand. 8,000. Some of those beautiful hymns that we see, blessed, we sing, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Safe in the arms of Jesus. And many other songs. Jesus, Jesus, my blessed Redeemer. She wrote 8,000 songs of worship. 
she worshiped god she literally worshiped god you know just go through those words blessed are zorans jesus is mine fanny crosby 19th century with everything stacked against her and she and she's writing that and we sing it with joy but some of those songs were birthed in pain so we realize sometimes we go through this and we we saw, see all these list of people who worship despite you know difficult times and you realize are these guys not in touch with reality you know does that cross your mind david worshiping abraham saying come we will worship paul and silas sitting and in a dungeon and singing so we tend to think right maybe they're not in touch with reality maybe they've lost it too much ministry too much word too much church they've lost it here but i want to propose to you that they were anchored to a greater reality they were anchored to a greater reality to a higher reality that they could see with eyes of faith amen so the father is seeking the true worshipper the father is seeking the true worshipper who will worship in spirit and truth who will be unquenchable in worship and we know that's not about a song but it's about your life the father is seeking them so when we when we what we see from their lives is we learn that worship is a choice that you make is a decision you make a choice and you say yeah i will recognize who god is i will i will revere who god is i will have communion with him i will commune with him in those difficult moments we see that worship goes beyond our emotions our emotions are up and down our emotions are up and down but the word of god says that jesus is the same yesterday today and forever there's that his word will stand the test of time so to be a worshipper in difficult times is to be anchored to that reality and say oh, i will i will proclaim this truth i will lift up this truth and the thing is this truth has this ability to set us free the lord jesus said you know the holy spirit will come he will guide us into all truth and the truth will set you free so in those times of worship in those times of pain those times of difficulties when we say god i will i choose to worship you god today i don't feel like it god i don't have those goosebumps oh god i don't have i don't feel it but i will choose to worship you i choose to keep my eyes on you i choose to acknowledge that you are who you said you are you know one pastor who lost his father uh, he says like this you know they were they were praying for healing contending but it didn't happen but and they were all in tears they were around him and they were worshiping they were praying and then he had this revelation you know this is the only time this side of eternity is the only time that i will be able to worship with my tears worship with those difficulties this is the only time because in heaven there are no tears there's no more sorrow no more pain so he said yes i choose to keep my eyes on him you know in his history there are many people who who worship god like this and when they did that they invited his rule and reign they invited the god who is the truth himself to set them free and not only god did sometimes god change the circumstance but god changed them and restored them and strengthened them to stand up and walk again so in difficult times may we run to him and worship maybe not run away from him in bitterness amen um, you know some of us we could have gone through terrible pain trauma tragedy 
can we run to him in worship now i just want us to sh- see this video and we'll close with this if you have that video um it's uh, about um horatio St- spafford and uh, he wrote this beautiful hymn it is well with my soul uh, maybe some of you know the history behind that hymn but let's just watch this uh, video
the faith shall be silent, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. just want to invite us to to fix our eyes on him you know we might be going through some tough times don't run away from him the one who is life don't run away from him who is hope don't run away from him who is salvation don't run away from him who loves unconditionally You see that worship is more than just a song we sing worship is how we live our lives and this morning if you are going through some tough times and challenges I just want to invite us to take it to the lord in prayer and fix our eyes on him and worship him because in worshiping him in this manner when we continue to acknowledge that god is who he is when we continue to respect him and honor him for who he is despite all the questions sometimes there are more questions than answers when we dig deep despite those moments when we worship him there is transformation there is healing there is restoration there is life that spirit of god breathes upon us amen so i just want us to uh, maybe stand at this moment and and talk to the lord at this time and i just want to uh, invite the worship team to come and <coughs> say lord i choose to admit and accept who you are as i come before you as it says in hebrews 11 and verse 6 i believe that you are who you said you are and i do that as an act of worship i believe that lord you are who you said you are in all the pages lord of scripture i do that as an act of worship and i honor you o oh god i respect and honor you god i do that as an act of worship lord i all the areas that i that are closed in my life God I open up and I choose to share my innermost feelings and thoughts oh God I choose to commune with you God I do that as an act of worship I choose to do that oh God
by our side you know if you've never invited Jesus into your life you know maybe now is the time to do that and you can just go before him and say Lord Jesus I invite you into my life I believe that you died for me on the cross I believe that you rose again to give me this new life so come into my life come into my heart God. I need you maybe there are some of us here who've never made that choice made that decision I just want to lead you in a prayer to do that. Prayer is just talking to God. In whatever language you speak, just talk to Him this morning and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me on the cross. I believe that you took my sin on the cross. I believe that you rose again on the third day. I believe that you rose again and you're seated in the heavens. I believe that, God. And this morning, I just want to invite you into my heart, into my life. The one who never lets go, the God of angel armies, come into my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray some more. And we're going to open this time. 
for those of us who are going through difficult times and saying you know i'm not able to worship i'm not able to i don't know where to put my next you know my next step maybe you're going through a tough time a hard time and we're just going to spend some time just praying so you you reach out to him god you make a decision this morning you make a choice and say god i choose to worship you lord i choose to acknowledge your truth i choose to elevate your truth I pray that those of us who've been through some tough times God your word says that you are always there that you are the god of all hope that you are the god of comfort and I just pray God may each one of us experience your presence in tangible ways may there may there be an impartation of hope an impartation of strength may there be an impartation of faith and i pray oh god that each one of us will be spirit and truth worshipers that it won't be about the superficial anymore but it will be about our heart communing with you oh god we thank you we thank you for this day thank you for this time we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance on you and give you a shalom even as you choose to be spirit and truth worshipers be an unquenchable worshiper amen amen god bless you have a great week ahead have a great sunday we trust that this message was a blessing to you we'd love to hear from you you can email us at contact@apcwo.org at also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources thank you for listening and god bless you